Hi, it's Miss Vital. This podcast corresponds with Chapter 55 in your AP Biology book, and it is called Ecosystems and Restoration Ecology. An ecosystem is the community, or all of the organisms, and all of the abiotic factors in an area. Energy flow and chemical cycling are two important processes that we're going to look at in this unit. The first law of thermodynamics is called conservation of energy. It states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transferred and transformed. Sunlight is used by autotrophs and converted into chemical energy. That is eaten by heterotrophs, and heterotrophs release that energy as heat. The second law of thermodynamics states that every exchange of energy increases the entropy of the universe. The law of conservation of mass states that matter cannot be created or destroyed. Chemicals are continually recycled in ecosystems. As things die, they are, their bodies are broken down, and the compounds in their bodies go back into the mix to be used to make new organisms. Primary producers are the trophic level that supports all other levels. They are autotrophs, mostly photosynthetic, on land there are plants, and in oceans and, other, and fresh body, bodies of water, they are algae. The rest of the trophic levels consist of heterotrophs. Primary consumers are herbivores that eat primary producers. Anything that eats plants or algae is considered a primary consumer. Secondary consumers are carnivores that eat the herbivores, but certain omnivores can be included in this level also. Carnivores that eat other carnivores are considered tertiary consumers, and this is the top level, and there's usually a small population of these top-level predators. Decomposers are extremely important in the environment. They get their energy from detrius, which is the non-living organic matter made of dead things. These are also considered heterotrophs. So once you have things breaking down, it almost forms something like a mulch, and that's actually what detritus is. Primary production is the amount of light energy converted to chemical energy or organic compounds by autotrophs during a given period of time. So basically, it's the amount of light energy that's converted into glucose through the process of photosynthesis. The global energy budget looks at only a small percentage of the sunlight reaching the Earth's surface. Because the sun radiates sunlight in all directions, a very small percentage of that actually reaches the surface of the Earth. And then only a very small percentage of that is used for photosynthesis. During the process of photosynthesis, only certain wavelengths in the light that strikes the plants are used for photosynthesis are used by photosynthetic pigments, mainly we're talking about green chlorophyll. So therefore, only about 1% of the visible light that strikes photosynthetic organisms is actually converted into chemical energy. Earth's primary producers produce about 150 billion metric tons, or 1.5 times 10 to the 14th kilograms of organic material every year. The GPP is a measurement called the gross primary production of the amount of energy from light that is converted to the chemical energy of organic molecules per unit time. Because the primary producers use some of the chemical energy they make for their own cellular respiration, we actually have to look at the NPP, which is the net primary production. This is when you take the gross primary production and minus the energy used by the primary producers for their cellular respiration, which is RA. That stands for autotrophic respiration. So basically what this means is that plants and algae take in sunlight and convert it into chemical energy, usually in the form of glucose. But they use some of that glucose for their own cellular respiration for their own energy. So this is talking about what's left over after they consume some of their own glucose. It's usually about half of the GPP. The 
The NTP represents the storage of chemical energy available to consumers in the ecosystem. So after the autotrophs use some of the energy for, to sustain their own life and for things like growth and reproduction, what's left and stored is available to the organisms who eat it. It can be expressed as energy per unit area per time. In other words, joules per meter squared per year, or biomass, which is the dry mass of vegetation, if you take away the water, added per unit area per unit time, which is grams per meter squared per year. Net ecosystem production, or NEP, is a measure of the total biomass accumulation during that time. It's the GPP minus the total respiration, or RT, of all of the organisms in the system. This includes decomposers and other heterotrophs. So NEP is equal to GPP minus RT. NEP is useful because its value determines whether an ecosystem is gaining or losing carbon over time. CO2 or oxygen entering or leaving an ecosystem is measured to estimate the NEP. If we look at primary production in aquatic ecosystems, we have to consider that light and nutrients are very important in controlling primary production in marine and freshwater ecosystems. Light is one variable in controlling primary production in these ecosystems, but nutrients are also a key variable. Limiting nutrients are elements that must be added for production to increase. Nitrogen and phosphorus are most often what limit marine production. Amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus are low in the photic zone because they're taken up by phytoplankton and because detritus sinks. Iron can also be a limiting nutrient and it comes from windblown dust off of the land. Ocean fertilization is a concept that can be used to remove CO2 from the atmosphere or greenhouse gases. A study was done that showed that adding iron to an area caused the phytoplankton to reproduce and cause what, what is called an algae bloom. The more algae, the more CO2 comes out of the atmosphere. However, for obvious reasons, this can be very controversial. Upwelling is a natural process where the deep nutrient-rich water circulate to the surface, causing exceptionally high primary production. In fresh water, Things like sewage and fertilizer that run off from farms and lawns add large amounts of nutrients. There's actually something called the Home Depot effect, where people go out and buy fertilizer and put it on their lawns, and then it rains and runs into nearby bodies of water. This causes an increase in bacteria and algae, and that causes a decrease in oxygen levels, which is bad for the other organisms living in that body of water. This process is called eutrophication. In terrestrial ecosystems, temperature and moisture are the main factors controlling primary production on land. Tropical rainforests are the most productive terrestrial ecosystems, and deserts and arctic tundra are the least productive terrestrial ecosystems. Minerals in the soil also limit primary production, and nitrogen and phosphorus, like they are in water, are the most limiting nutrients in terrestrial ecosystems. However, Plants have evolved certain adaptations that increase their uptake of these limiting nutrients. For example, symbiotic nitrogen-fixing bacteria in the roots of plants convert atmospheric nitrogen into a usable form that the plants can use. And mycorrhizae are fungi that live in the roots of plants and increase the uptake of nutrients in water by the plants. As we've discussed before, the energy transfer between trophic levels is about 10%. Secondary production is the amount of chemical energy in consumers' food that is converted to their own biomass given, during a given period of time. So in other words, when an organism consumes food, the chemical energy in their food is converted into the cells of their bodies. We can measure the efficiency of animals as energy transformations by this equation. 
Production efficiency equals net secondary production times 100 divided by assimilation of primary production. The net secondary production is the energy stored in the biomass represented by, which we can look at growth and reproduction to get an idea of how much energy is stored in the bodies of the organisms. Assimilation is all of the energy that's taken in. So what this means is production efficiency is the percentage of energy stored in assimilated food that is not used for cellular respiration. If we move away from production efficiencies of individuals, we can look at the energy flow through the trophic levels. We've already discussed that trophic efficiency is about 10%. It's always less than productive efficiencies because they take into account not only the energy lost through respiration and in feces, but also the energy in organic matter in a lower trophic level that is not consumed by the next trophic level. The progressive loss of energy along a food chain severely limits the amount of top-level consumers. Biogeochemical cycles are the cycles that involve both biotic and abiotic components in ecosystems. If we look at the water cycle, the water that cycles from the atmosphere back down to the surface of the earth is the same water that has cycled through ecosystems since the beginning of our planet. Transpiration is a type of evaporation from plants. Other evaporation occurs off of bodies of water and off of the surface of land. That water evaporates and then condenses to form clouds. Remember, clouds are made of liquid water that clings to particles in the atmosphere. That liquid water can fall to the earth in the form of precipitation, rain, snow, sleet. It can either go right into the ocean or it can run off um, from, body, from the uh, bodies of land into other bodies of water like oceans, rivers, ponds, or it can actually go underground and become um, groundwater. The carbon cycle basically is the cycling of carbon through photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Photosynthesis releases oxygen and consumes CO2. Cellular respiration is the opposite. It con consumes oxygen and releases CO2. However, this cycle is added to by the burning of fossil fuels, which releases a lot of excess CO2 into the atmosphere. And as you know, that is the cause of climate change. The nitrogen cycle is when microorganisms living in the soil and in roots of plants take atmospheric nitrogen and convert it into a usable form that can be used to make proteins. The phosphate cycle or the phosphorus cycle is basically if animals and plants die, their organic compounds that contain phosphorus are released into the soil. That can be, become part of water and turn into solution in water. Then it can precipitate out and form rocks. The rocks can be weathered and release the phosphates containing phosphorus back into the ecosystem. Again, decomposers play an essential role in cycling of nutrients, and if it wasn't for them, the earth would be piled deep in debris. Bioremediation is using organisms to get rid of pollution. Two examples of how, of how bioremediation is used is we use bacteria to get rid of waste in sewage treatment plants, and we use engineered bacteria that are capable of consuming oil and breaking it down and releasing it into harmless compounds in oil spills. Biological augmentation is actually a process where we use organisms to add essential materials to um, a ecosystem that is lacking something. For example, we can grow legumes in areas that are disturbed by mining to add nitrogen back to the soil.